Fleet, welcome back to another episode in the Know Your Ship series. Today's episode is going to be about the Invincible class battle cruisers of the Royal Navy. Just one quick piece of news before I start, and that is in relation to World of Warships Beta. The announcement that we were expecting out of PAX didn't occur, and Gunlion, Warship NA's community manager, has already apologized for that mistake. Nevertheless, from the things that I am able to see, I still believe that the beta is not too far off. So, while we wait patiently for it, might as well get to know another ship. The British battlecruisers have often been looked upon as flawed concepts, and will forever be attached to Admiral Beatty's quote, There seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today. But hopefully, by the end of today's episode, you'll see these battlecruisers differently. The Invincible class battlecruisers entered service in 1908 as the world's first battlecruisers. There were three ships of the class, HMS Invincible, HMS Inflexible, and HMS Indomitable. They would be laid down in 1906, launched in 1907, and commissioned into service between 1908 and 1909. The ships cost 1.7 million pounds to complete, and at first these ships were simply classified as fast armored cruisers. However, in 1911, they were formally designated as battlecruisers. The Invincible class battlecruisers were 173 meters long, 23.9 meters wide, and displaced 20,750 tons deep load, which means full load of ammunition, stores, and fuel. The most obvious feature of these ships are their large main guns. The Invincible class battlecruisers were equipped with eight 305mm or 12-inch Mark X guns. HMS Invincible was initially tested with an electric powered gun turrets, but these did not really work at all and were instead replaced by traditional hydraulic systems in 1913-1914. These guns were mounted in quite an interesting configuration. There was one turret at the front of the ship, designated A, followed by two wing turrets designated as P and Q, and finally, one aft turret, which was designated X. The wing turrets were staggered from one another, thereby giving the turrets the ability to fire in a limited arc towards the other side of the ship. The reason for this design is the ability to maximize broadside fire, as well as maximizing end-on fire, as these battle cruisers were expected to chase down enemy ships with their high speed, and therefore having maximum forward po firepower is actually quite important. Some of you might have wondered, well, why didn't they simply just have a super-firing turret in the front? And that was because the blast effect from the gun on top would enter through the ports of the lower gun and injure the crews. The 305mm guns could be depressed to negative 3 degrees and elevated to 13.5 degrees. However, during World War I, the guns would have an increased elevation up to 16 degrees. The gun was capable of firing a 390 kilogram or 850 pound shell to a maximum range of 16,450 meters or nearly 18,000 yards. At the 16 degree elevation, the range was increased to 18,688 meters or nearly 20,500 yards. The ships were capable of firing between one to two rounds a minute and the ships had a total of 880 shells for their main guns or 110 shells per gun. While the ships were initially designed with 12-pounder guns as secondaries, it was soon discovered that a 12-pounder gun had very little hope in stopping a destroyer. So instead, a larger 4-inch QF Mark III gun was chosen to replace the 12-pounders very early on in the ship's construction. As the years went by, the secondary guns were replaced with newer and better guns. For example, HMS Inflexible had a 4-inch QF Mark III's replaced by 4-inch BL Mark IX's in 1917. The Invincibles were also equipped with five 405mm submerged torpedo tubes. Armor protection on the battle cruisers were lacking, having a maximum of only 152mm or 6 inches of belt armor and having between 38 to 64mm or 1.5 to 2.5 inches of deck armor. The turrets and barbettes had 178mm or 7 inches of armor. And the thinking behind this lack of armor protection was the belief that the engagement ranges would be really short, at around 8 to 9,000 meters, and that the shells would hit in a rather flat trajectory. And they thought that this amount of armor would be sufficient against other armored cruisers, which at this time only carried medium caliber guns. 
However, this lack of armor would be exposed to deadly effect at the Battle of Jutland when the battle cruisers were deployed in a role for which they were ill-suited. The Invincible class battle cruisers were amazingly fast for their time. They had four Parson steam turbines which generated 45,000 shaft horsepower across four screws, which pushed the ship to a maximum speed of over 25 knots. The ships carried a mixture of oil and coal as their fuel and were capable of a range of nearly 5,700 kilometers at 22.3 knots. It was this ability to maintain speeds of over 20 knots for days on end that set them apart from other warships of that era, which were only able to maintain their maximum speed for a few hours. It's also what allowed the Invincible and Inflexible to chase the German East Asia squadron so effectively from the Falklands, but a little bit more on this a bit later on. Yet the most important question still needs to be answered. Was the battle cruiser concept a flawed concept? Well, my answer to this question is most likely no. However, I do think that the battle cruisers were used in roles that they were ill suited to. The battle cruisers were designed for the purposes of maintaining Britain's control of the seas. They were intended to be a rapid reaction force for anything that was to threaten Britain's interests. Furthermore, by having flexible, fast squadrons, it would allow the Royal Navy to decommission and scrap many of its older, outdated warships that were based in overseas stations all around the world. This would therefore reduce the financial burden that was placed upon Britain's economy by these obsolete ships. The battle cruisers represented in what can be described in modern terms as a rapid response naval task force, which as many of you are aware is still in existence today. In this role, the battle cruisers would excel and be highly effective. However, because of their battleship armament, the battle cruisers were often used in the line of battle, a role that it was ill suited to playing. It was in these engagements that the Royal Navy battle cruiser would show its weakness and be labeled as a flawed design. To illustrate this issue, one only has to examine the use of the battle cruiser in the actions of the Battle of the Falkland Islands, where the Invincible and the Inflexible successfully chased down and destroyed the German East Asia Squadron, while the disastrous use of battle cruisers as ships that could engage other heavy ships at Jutland led to a significant loss of life for the British Royal Navy. While the Invincible class battle cruisers served in a number of actions, such as the Battle of the Heligoland Bight, the Battle of Dogger Bank, the Dardanelles Campaign, it's their battles at the Falklands and Jutland that I want to focus on today. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy a bit of documentary footage on these two battles. News of the black defeat at Coronel staggered a British public reared on the legend of an unconquerable navy. U-boats, mines, the Emden, and now a British squadron smashed in a fair fight. The Admiralty, already under heavy criticism, reacted instantly and ferociously. The battle cruisers, Invincible and Inflexible, were ordered out to find von Spee and destroy him. There was to be no delay. The Admiral Superintendent, Devonport, reports that the earliest possible date for completion of Invincible and Inflexible is midnight the 13th of November. Admiralty to CMC Devonport. Ships are to sail Wednesday the 11th of November. They are needed for war service and dockyard arrangements must conform. If necessary, dockyard men should be sent away in the ships to return as opportunity may offer. You are held responsible for the speedy dispatch of these ships in a thoroughly efficient condition. On Wednesday, November the 11th, the two great ships under Admiral Sturdy steamed south towards the South Atlantic and the Falkland Islands. Forty-five Allied warships were now after von Spee's blood. He had no illusions. We have at least contributed in a certain measure to the glory of our arms, although that cannot signify greatly against the enormous number of British ships. Unknown to each other, von Spee and Sturdy were steaming towards the same place at the same time, the Falklands. Sturdy arrived first. He was coaling in the morning after his arrival when he received the signal a four-funneled and a two-funneled man of war in sight. The ships he was scouring the ocean for were sailing into his arms. 
The British crews worked feverishly to prepare their ships for the chase. The Germans at first thought they had surprised a cruiser squadron. Then, suddenly, the Germans saw the tripod masts. Battle cruisers. They meant certain death. The battle cruisers swept out of the harbor. For three hours, they chased von Spee, eating up his 15-mile lead. At nine miles, sturdy opened fire. The Scharnhorst and the Gneisenau fought back gallantly, but they had no hope. We could feel one or two shots coming, and hitting us, we could hear, we could hear the shots piercing in the funnels and the superstructure and the case, casings. And, but we were assured from time to time from the bridge that all was going well. Sturdy's advantage was overwhelming. The British gunnery was uneven and many shells that did land on target failed to pierce the German armor. It was five hours before Scharnhorst sank now soon followed her. The Kent finished off the light cruiser Nuremberg. She was on fire, fired and aft, and some of them were jumping into the water on bits of wreckage so as to try and get to us, but the seas were icy cold. We all had the impression that those Germans were very, very plucky people. I actually saw one man pull out the flag that was aft how I got hold of it and I saw him as he was sinking under the water, still waving that flag as that ship went down, much to say Deutschland still Uber Allies. Only one light cruiser escaped. Coronel was avenged at the expense of three quarters of the battle cruiser's ammunition and some disturbing questions about the quality of British gunnery. This time to the Invincible now at the front of the British line. As she led the whole of the Grand Fleet forward, her and the, the other two battlecruisers had a, a reasonable view of the German battlecruisers before them. And at short range, they pounded them. They really badly damaged the Lutzau, the Seydlitz. And the Germans could barely reply. Then suddenly, the mists before the Germans cleared. What happened was almost inevitable. One of their shells seems to have penetrated yet again one of the turrets of the Invincible. There was an enormous flash. There are amazing photographs of the flash and the huge explosion that followed. She sank, and as she sank, her back broke, and the two, the two, the bow and the stern stuck out of the water in the most macabre sight. Look again at the photograph. What a weird sight. Within those two parts of the ship, there were men struggling for their lives. Men for whom the floor had become the ceiling. The ceiling had become the floor. They didn't know where they were. Imagine what it was like below decks. Those men were doomed. Nothing could be done for them, nothing whatsoever. The loss of the Invincible continued the grim pattern of the day. 1,022 dead. Six survivors. The German ships were taking a pounding, but they were resilient. On the way to Invincible, the dive team passes the site of the Lutzow, a German battle cruiser. Unlike the British ships, despite being shelled beyond recognition, she did not blow up, and only went to the bottom later when scuttled by her own crew. 
I understand she was hit 24 times. But when you consider that the Queen Mary, the Indefatigable, and the Invincible were hit no more than three or four, maybe five times, the Lutzow withstood a huge amount of damage. So why were the British battle cruisers so vulnerable? Why does it seem the British got their design so wrong? Bill explains. Here we have a situation where I've drawn this graph that takes the nominal ship, divided into three compartments that are the same, protection, armament, speed, right? And comparing Lutzow, Queen Mary, and Invincible in the same way. And here you can see that Lutzow has a great deal of protection and only a small amount of speed. And here, Invincible has only a small amount of protection and a great deal of speed. In a slugging match, Lutzow is going to win almost every time, provided you hit, because she has much more protection. She can take the shots, and Invincible can't. Indefatigable, Queen Mary, Defense, and Invincible simply hadn't the armor for the roles they were given that day at Jutland. The Invincible was famed as one of the fastest firing ships in the fleet. This grew from a Royal Navy culture where swamping the enemy with shell after shell was preferred over slow, accurate fire. If you shoot quickly, you're effectively intimidating the Germans from aiming properly at you, and you're basically protecting your ships in the process. I actually know um, two old gentlemen who are now dead who served in ships in the uh, Grand Fleet during Jutland. And they were boys seamen, and they said that in the handling room, the charges were being brought up, and they were taken out of the cases, and they were stacked around the handling room. Now, this shouldn't happen. For safety's sake, cordite was normally stored in tubular containers until it was needed. In the heat of battle, these were, quite frankly, a nuisance. It's quite a tight fit. Your cartridge comes out there, and then you have to place them somewhere, ready for them to be moved. To the, uh, to the other part of the ship. Well, that's all very well with a six inch one, but with a 15 inch car cartridge like this, which you've got four, it's a whole different ball game. They, they just discovered they could not get the ammunition out of the boxes fast enough to get it into the ammunition hoist in order to be shoot as quickly as they wanted to do it. So increasingly what they do is they remove a quantity of the cordite from the boxes before shooting begins and stop pilot inside the magazine, just inside the door. As the charges come up, they were taken in and stacked, ready for the next broadside. The emphasis is, don't starve the guns. The guns must be kept firing all time. Keep them going. The process of getting the cordite from the magazine below up to the turret above was slow and difficult, made harder by the safety devices in place along the supply chain. To prevent flash fire travelling down to the magazines, there were shutter devices between the handling rooms and covers on the hoists and a series of steel doors would isolate each step in the chain. At least those were the regulations. They also had this cult, this British cult, of trying to do everything as fast as possible. And to that end, they cut every corner possible. So where there were safety doors that were meant to be kept locked or shut, they'd open them so they could get things through it quicker. Where they were supposed to only have the shell they were dealing with, they'd bring up extra shells, they'd bring up extra cordite, they'd bring up extra, you know, and they stacked it round so it would be more convenient. But it was also there for when the flash came. And when the shells got into the turrets, then flash was the enemy of the ship. It wasn't just the enemy, it was, it was, it was the end of the ship. The gun crews of Invincible had been building a bomb and they had handed the enemy the fuse. And that's all folks for this episode on the Invincible class battle cruisers. These ships which were asked to do something that they were ill suited for at Jutland as well as the multiple corners that were cut in an attempt to fire faster led to disaster. However, when they were used properly, they performed their jobs well and the thinking behind them was actually quite ahead of their times. I hope that I've been able to help shed just a little bit more light on these warships, and I really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you like what I'm doing, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel. And aside from all that, I hope you all have a fantastic week, and I'll see you all on the high sea soon.